with Senators Matt Dolan and Nikki Antonio, um, and also a, a panel of guests who are here to share perspective on what's been happening in early childhood through the pandemic and what we need to do to think about working together on the recovery, especially when it relates to the needs of young children and their families and also the early childhood system. So um, we have a very full agenda for you today. Um, my name is Katie Kelly. I'm the director of Pre for CLE in Cleveland. Pre for CLE is working to expand high quality preschool to all of Cleveland's three and four year olds in partnership with our early childhood programs, including Child Care and Head Start, the school district and um, all of our early learning partners here in the city of Cleveland. So we're so happy to host this today with Groundwork Ohio, um, really bringing you direct access to our policymakers who are helping to shape and mold our early childhood policies and funding um, every single day. So um, it's my honor to also introduce our panelists today. Um, we are joined by uh, of course, Senator Nikki Antonio uh, from Senate District 23 and Senator Matt Dolan from Senate District 24. We also have with us today, Lenan Gutierrez, the Assistant Director and Legal Counsel for Groundwork. Carla Martin, who is the Quality Director for Starting Point and Michelle Curry, who's the Executive Director for Merrick House in Cleveland. Um, and they're all here to give different perspectives on what children and families and programs are experiencing during this time. Um, and just a little housekeeping note before we get started, you are all um, on mute as well as your, uh, your videos are all turned off. You will only be seeing the video of the speaker. Um, we encourage you to enter your questions into the chat box. We will be monitoring those throughout the panel and um, we will be looking at those questions at the end when we have our Q&A session. So please, as people are speaking, enter your questions in, we'll be looking at those. You will only be able to see your own questions. Um, so that is uh, a reminder um, to uh, just make sure that you're participating through the chat box. All right, well, um, first we're gonna hear from Lenan Gutierrez from Groundwork, who's gonna share some perspective, some high level perspective on what's been happening at the state level since March, since the pandemic began, um, and the, the steps that the state has taken to, to support the early childhood system um, during this time. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Lenian Gutierrez. I'm the Assistant Director at Groundwork Ohio, and I'm going to give you kind of a, uh, this high-level interview, as Katie's asked me to do, um, on what's been going on in child in terms of our child care system since March. Um, just real quick note: uh, many of you have joined us before, I'm sure, but Groundwork Ohio is the nonpartisan public policy research and advocacy organization dedicated to champion early early learning and healthy development strategies in the prenatal to age five period. Um, child care is one of our, um, you know, nearest and dearest uh, issues. Um, and, and one of the reasons is why, why is that it serves the most low income and low income children in Ohio, young children in Ohio, um, as compared to any other child serving system in our state. Um, only second to uh, Medicaid for young children. So it really is um, uh, an incredibly powerful two-generation approach to both serve parents um, who need to get to work and provide for their family and want a safe place for children to be, but also um, for children in those first um, precious years of life where over 90% of brain development is happening in the first five years and they need high quality learning environments to be set up um, for future success, both in school and in life. So with that kind of context, you know, we really want to thank first Governor DeWine and his administration. They've made an incredible effort over the past month to protect the public from harm, support the health systems that are needed to fight COVID-19 and address the severe economic impact on many businesses to set the stage for a swift economic recovery. Um, child care has been and continues to be essential for each of these efforts. And in fact, None of them can happen without a well-functioning childcare system. 
Uh, but these past months have certainly exposed um, a common theme that we continue to talk, talk about in childcare is that this, this, this crisis is really just exposing more broadly the crises that we were facing prior to the pandemic and the fundamental weaknesses in our childcare system that many families, early educators, and employers have experienced over decades. So um, high quality childcare is a foundation on which all the other industries rely and there's no quick fix or easy solution. Um, but we know as we move into this recovery period and continue to, to kind of weather the storm, especially throughout the winter months, um, that childcare requires investment, time and attention, uh, certainly as we look forward, um, look to Congress and look to uh, our state budget deliberations um, to deliver on the promise of preserving this really critical system. So just to, to give you a sense, prior to the pandemic, I said childcare was a, a large state program. It serves about 117,000 children in publicly funded childcare. So this is those children and families who are at or, uh, at or below 130% of the federal poverty level. Um, we have one of the lowest uh, initial eligibilities um, in, in the nation. Um, and, uh, and that really leave, makes it so that if families are earning a typical family of three above $27,000 a year, they don't qualify. So these are really the most um, in need, low income working families. During the mandatory closure, which occurred in March and April, all child care programs were required to close unless they were operating under a temporary pandemic license. And publicly funded children of essential workers were cared for during that time. But during that time, you can see we went from 117,000 kids being served to about 15 or 16,000. And since reopening in June, um, we've seen a slow capacity recover over time as programs have chosen to reopen. And of course, when they reopened in June, they were required um, to reopen, I'm sorry, in May, um, when they were required to reopen in May, um, they were restricted in terms of both ratios and class size. And then as we've seen the growth over the summer, um, we, we have, have recovered some of that some of that capacity. Um, but one of the reasons um, why our state, and I'll, I'll share with you kind of where we're at today, um, one of the reasons why we were able to, to, to pivot so quickly is because, first of all, kind of the, the heroic efforts of providers to continue to meet needs of families during the mandatory closure. And secondly, that the state um, received $113 million in um, CARES Act dollars specifically for child care through our child care development block grant coming from uh, the federal government. And that really allowed, um, number one, those essential worker families um, that qualify for publicly funded care to be served. And it allowed our current state investment in child care to go to trying to maintain capacity while programs are closed, so providing closure payments. And that has really, um, I think, been extraordinary in setting us apart. Um, certainly, we have uh, uh, many devastating impacts, um, but has allowed us to, to really look forward um, in our recovery process. So we thank um, the administration for that decision. And then, of course, the remainder of the CARES Act dollars going to child care, about $60 million, when child care programs reopened, um, they received grant payments to help them cover part of the cost of this new higher uh, higher um, cost of operating their program. So lower class size um, and lower teacher to child ratios means, um, means that they're able to serve less children and less revenue coming to their program. And they also had the increased cost um, of implementing new safety regulations. So that cleaning uh, and other protocols that were on top of what childcare was already, um, already used to doing. So, we can move on to the next slide and kind of take us up till now. I mentioned there's some good news, um, which is that 92% of programs have reopened and remain open at this time since that mandatory closure um, was lifted. And um, um, this, so this represents a loss of about 500 programs. And I, you know, 92% sounds good, but 500 programs um, is, is fairly significant for our state um, and represents about the loss of serving about 16,000 less children at, at this point um, at, as compared to last year in August. So, um, you know, we, we have certainly lost capacity. 
um, you know, we think about in terms of those program closures that about 60% of those are centers and 40% are family child care homes. What um, I think is, is critical for us to continue to evaluate as we just received some, some new data to this end, but the age distribution of these children is significantly different. And so um, this kind of early analysis is telling us that childcare has really taken on the gaps that the K-12 system has left um, in the care um, of children, those school-age children. So we're serving more, more school-age children that we typically do. We have less preschoolers, less than half of the amount of toddlers we typically serve, and less infants. And we already had infant toddler child care deserts across the state. So this impact is very concerning considering that, that unique brain development for our youngest children. Um, as we investigate the age distribution and, and, and those changes in capacity, we're also looking to see how the racial distribution of children served uh, may have changed. So we, we look forward to sharing more on that. Um, I want to be really clear though, that we are concerned about the current losses we're seeing in this snapshot that I've given you, um, that childcare programs in the system really continue to hang in the balance at the mercy of additional support. So that initial CARES Act dollars, that 113 million I mentioned, um, and that went part, partially went out in, in, um, uh, in grant support, that money was gone at the end of July. And so the administration secured an additional 30 million and thank you um, to the legislature and our two senators on the line here um, for approving an additional 30 million through the state controlling board um, that allowed the administration to stretch out that smaller pot of money to provide uh, additional support, grant support payments in August, September, um, and even through this month. But yet again, we find ourselves here in October um, at, at a point where the money ha will have all have been spent and we are still facing um, a, a, this, this crisis. In the next slide, this, this really boils it down and, and this has been affirmed by JFS in terms of their concern is that um, when, when providers were surveyed across the state, 53% of programs indicated that they would close within six months if no her, further help was provided. So those monthly grant payments have been, you know, a life, a, a, a small lifeline to help programs keep hanging on. But without, um, without additional resources, we're going to continue to see um, the impact, the impact on our child care system, which, which is, has, has and continues to be um, devastating to to our workforce um, and to certainly the, the child care field so you know we we look we anticipate there's going to be con continued persistent issues um, with attendance at programs so publicly funded child care is based programs get paid based on children coming um, so as work schedules change as parent choice changes that impacts their bottom line. And I think most importantly is that we're seeing, and you know, even myself, I've experienced childcare classrooms are being quarantined. And when those children are quarantined for two weeks, those programs are not getting paid um, for those children. And that is, is really deeply impacting um, their business model. The grants have ended. There's no resources to help soften the blow. The grants are ending this month. And uh, we continue to hear across the state incredible challenges to the early childhood workforce. So the poverty wages um, at 10.67 an hour were not acceptable before um, before the pandemic, but we have many programs who want to serve more kids, want to increase their capacity, and cannot find the staff um, to secure uh, to, to secure those classrooms to serve additional children. So um, this is just in summary. We we have an urgent emergency. We have an urgent need for emergency federal funding to save childcare capacity. We have been advocating um, consistently and and very uh, strongly throughout the summer and into the fall that Congress needs to come uh, with a release package uh, that delivers um, a significant investment in childcare across the nation. Our ask has been 50 billion. Uh, across the nation, that House's most recent um, Heals Act, the most recent release pa release package that's been proposed, included 57 billion for child care, and we are uh, continuing to work with our congressional delegation to ensure that when there is a release package, and we hope that is uh, very soon, that includes child care. And um, to certainly to the senators on the line today, and 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 looking forward to our next um, uh, our 
state budget. We need increased state funding and the preser and, and at a at a bare minimum, the preservation of current state and federal investments in Ohio's child care system. We really cannot afford to lose a dollar. Um, uh, it, it means serving less kids and it, and it means serving kids in, in, in environments that uh, are not ultimately serving their, their, um, their well-being um, if, if we're not able to maintain these investments. So I will stop there and uh, appreciate everyone um, and their insights on the panel today. Thanks. Good, uh, good morning, I believe I'm here. Good morning, I am so glad to have this opportunity to talk to everyone. I am representing Starting Point, um, the Child Care Resource and Referral Agency, serving Ashtabula, Cuyahoga, Geauga, and Lake Counties. I wanna take um, this time to share with you about um, a little bit about what is the impact, what impact is happening to the programs in Northeast Ohio. Uh, we have an opportunity to talk with providers because we provide technical assistance. We have conducted surveys with um, programs and providers, and we have learned a lot about what their concerns are. So I'm going to share a little bit about um, what they have shared with us and how the pandemic is effect affecting them. So the child care um, staff are really concerned. One of the things that's happened is when they when programs reopened and they had legitimate concerns about returning to work and their exposure to COVID-19. A lot of our child care providers are um, older child care providers who sometimes may have high risk. And because of that situ that because of that, many of them had to make decisions not to return. They had to, those are kind of they had to make those hard decisions not to return to um, the child care programs. Also, what has happened is that we have um, teachers and providers who have younger children who are who currently have school-aged children. And some of their concerns are that they have children who are in schools who are, who are virtual right now, and they need to be at home um, helping them with their education so some teachers have not um, returned. They have not returned. So overall, what we have found is that once the programs reopened, not all of the teachers were available to come back to work and that has affected the workforce, the early child care workforce. So for those teachers or providers, administrators who have decided to return to the classroom and are doing their daily activities, when talking to them, we have found that they have this increased level of stress. Where is the stress coming from? The demand that has been placed upon them to um, keep up with the COVID preventative measures to make sure that the children are safe, the families are safe, and that the child care is safe, such as trying to maintain the mask requirements or increasing hand washing or sanitizing. This has placed a, large, a huge demand on staff and um, has caused an increased stress. Also, one of the biggest supports for um, teachers and is the relationship that they have with their families. And since COVID, it has, this has placed how they interact, I'm gonna say that, how they interact with families has changed. So, Families in some programs are not um, able to come into the programs because they want to reduce these, the possibility of the spread of COVID. So these, if I don't know if you if you've had young ones, you will know that that the drop off and pickup times of when the 
parents come in and they talk with the teachers. These are very valuable times. And so because now we are, teachers are having to meet programs outside, um, that has kind of changed the interactions that um, teachers and administrators can have with families. What else has happened with families is that um, they are not um, able to have as many special family activities where they're actually on site. And we're, they are trying to figure out new ways to interact with families because it's very important to keep families involved in their child's education. So these are some of the um, different ways that they have learned to interact with families. If we look at um, the children's learning, we're also concerned, we know that, and um, Lenann just talked about that not all of the families have returned or have decided to put their children back into childcare, hence the low en enrollment. So we are concerned about those other children that were in childcare before quote, the pandemic spread and what they are not exposed to, what kind of learning activities um, they are not receiving. How are they gonna be prepared when they enter kindergarten next year or the year after that? So uh, we're, that is a concern above childcare um, programs and staff is what are the children learning and how are they gonna help those children? We're noticing too that um, there may be a social emotional impact on children as well that there, to, I can use the word, there may be a, um, a little trauma involved because what's happened is the children were in their childcare programs. They were with teachers that they were familiar with and staff they were familiar with, with children they were familiar with, and then they had to go home. And then I know that we opened up licensed pandemic programs, and so they may have had to go to a different program. And then they had to meet new staff and new children. And then again, we had this transition where we went to reopening in late May, and then they may have had to go to a different um, center. So we don't know as of yet what kind of impact this is having, what social emotional impact this is having on children. They, they, I'm sure children have noticed that the way the teachers interact with them are different, is different, that um, the the staff, they're all wearing these masks, they're hiding their face, they can't see their teachers smile. So um, we know that that has had an impact on the children as well. One other, one thing I wanna go on and talk to you about that has been a real impact, and this was mentioned earlier, is the reduced capacity and enrollment. So, um, you know, we know that the ratios have changed when they were pandemic licensed. I believe it was one to six, if I recall. And then when they opened up in late May, it went to one and nine. And then most recently, programs have been able to decide whether they want to go to a full in, uh, capacity and they have that option. And what we have found is that most programs have decided to stay at the lower ratio. And I think they've made that decision to um, make sure that the staff is safe and they can, um, it's easier to maintain the pandemic policies and so forth. But in doing that, what's going to happen? They are reducing their revenue. And um, we know that, and this is, again, this has been mentioned earlier, that the, the supports, the, the grants that have been available are discontinuing now. And the concern among the programs is how are they gonna maintain? What do they do now? Do they try to go to full enrollment or do they try to stay at the lower um, enrollment? Something interesting that we've noticed as well is that even though they're at low enrollment, we can still find programs who haven't been able to meet their full capacity. 
And that is a result of families making decisions not to put their children back into childcare because they're worried about the safe and health of their children. And they have found other ways to, um, to keep their children safe. They're using family and friends instead of using um, what they would normally, normally lose, use, which is childcare. We also see that, um, yeah, yeah. So what, so what else does that mean for staff? What it means for staff is how does that affect them? So if you have fewer children enrolled, then are you gonna be able to bring your staff? Are they gonna get fewer hours? So that's going to affect the amount of time uh, amount their their wages, so that um, is important as well. So I think that there's a, there's two big um, challenges that are facing the Northeast Ohio learning programs. One is the economic impact. What are they going to do? Are they going to have to try to increase their enrollment um, to maintain? What's going to happen to the programs? And how are they going to do that, especially with the ending of the discontinuation of the pandemic support grant? And secondly, because many of the staff have decided not to return, how are they going to fill those positions once they increase their enrollment? Because a lot of their, because of the step up, there are um, qualifications that the staff have to meet, and that is going to be a common concern. So I think that as we move ahead, we need to think about how we're going to support the programs and what we're gonna do in the future to make sure that we have qualified staff in the program. Thank you. I can, yes. Good morning, Senator Dolan, Senator Antonio, and to everyone with us today. Katie and Lynn thank you for inviting me to speak at this town hall meeting. My name is Michelle Curry, and I'm the Executive Director of Merrick House Neighborhood Center, where we operate a five-star quality rated, pre-kindergarten designated, and a pre for clee early adopter child care center. Some of the challenges we experienced in operating a child care center during the pandemic include keeping the doors open and staff employed. Our child care center is our revenue generator. When Governor DeWine was encouraging parents to keep their children home, tuition for private paid parents was only paid through March 31st, as was the, the vouchers. And uh, what was the need for private paid parents um, to pay tuition for April if they were not going to bring their children? When we became a pandemic center, um, enrollment was low for about the first three weeks. Um, we were not certain that we were going to remain open. Fortunately, enrollment picked up and we stayed open. We had about 21 families during that time. Um, we also applied for the PPP loan, which helped us. And the pandemic payments were very beneficial in helping us keep our doors open and staff employed. Another challenge was ensuring the overall health and safety of the children and staff. Um, the additional cost of cleaning the building, um, the classrooms, sanitizing toys, purchasing PPE and cleaning supplies, and toiletries um, just to make sure that the children and staff remain safe. Now I mentioned um, finding or paying for PPE. So it was challenging finding PPE and cleaning supplies. At the start of the pandemic, um, we had a very difficult time finding thermometers, Clorox wipes, hand sanitizer, face masks, and cleaning supplies. Things that you know we all take for granted. Um, one of our parents, fortunately, um, who was a nurse, brought us her thermometer because we could not find a thermometer anywhere. It was taking two to three weeks to get them. Um, we have parents in block clubs um, in the area 
that donated PPE and cleaning supplies to us. Um, when we would come in daily, we would have things left at our doorsteps or throughout the day, um, individuals would, would drop off items. Um, to date, we have spent approximately $24,800 on cleaning and disinfecting our building and approximately $35,000 on cleaning supplies. As we approach um, flu season, these costs are just going to continue to increase. Another challenge was adapting our staffing and facilities to comply with the reduced child ratio mandate. Um, we had to purchase classroom dividers. Um, we purchased portable sinks to ensure hand washing was occurring readily. Um, the additional supplies that were needed when you divide a classroom, you have to make sure that you have supplies because we are a quality rated center. So there are certain items that have to be in our classrooms. Um, setting up um, points of entry and exiting for drop off and pickup. We were one of those centers that um, did not allow parents to, to come into the building. So that required extra staff to be runners again, to uh, take children to their classrooms in the morning and then return them um, to their parents in the evening. Um, pivoting as we receive guidance um, from ODJFS regarding updates to policies and procedures due to COVID. Oftentimes there were weekly changes um, that required us to tweak how we did business. Um, it could be a procedure that we implemented that needed to be changed or you know, just uh, adapted to be more stringent. Or um, perhaps there was a change in how we reported information to the state in order to be paid. The mental health of our children and staff, um, we have seen an increased amount of behavioral concerns in our children. Um, they're not partaking in specials or those extracurricular activities as they did prior to the pandemic, as Ms. Martin mentioned. Um, and also on-site support that we would originally receive, we're, we're not getting that because those entities are not allowed to come into the buildings. With the reduced ratios, it makes it more challenging for one teacher um, to deal with these behaviors, which also causes the teacher stress and affects them mentally. The other part that I want to talk about is technology. And again, Ms. Martin mentioned this as well. Drop off and pick up times are intricate times for teachers to interact with the parents, for the parents to ask questions of the teachers. And COVID has pretty much prevented that. So it, it made us value um, technology and understand that we needed to become more technologically savvy during this time. So what we did was we um, utilized technology to readily communicate um, with our parents. And that's with our pandemic parents and with those parents also who chose not to bring their children to the center. And we um, utilized an app called, um, a system called Blooms to readily send out blasts to parents so that they could have activities to work with their children on, to find out how things were going at the center if they were looking to bring their child back, what provisions we had in place to ensure the safety um, of their children. So technology has been very, very, very important and I'm sure it will continue to be important as we go through the, this COVID phase. But um, as I close, I wanna leave you um, with three pleas for help. First, there are no provisions in place to test child care staff for COVID-19. Child care staff are essential and need regular testing. Second, the child care ratio and pandemic support payments allowed us to keep our doors open, children safe and staff employed. We were very, very fortunate throughout this time in that we have a limited number of vacancies. Our core team has been with us since we closed and reopened as a pandemic site and reopened under the reduced ratios. Our core team has really stayed intact and kudos to them for weathering the storm daily and supporting our families and being there for our children. We need continued financial support from the state. And then third, um, we had a very difficult time finding PPE and cleaning supplies to ensure the safety of our children, parents, and staff. We need support with a centralized purchasing system. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for sharing their experiences and um, 
perspective on what's been happening at the state level, at the local level, and then at the program level. So now um, we want to turn over um, the program to our two senators. Senator Matt Dolan is going to start us off. And what we've asked them to do is just to share uh, their perspective as state policymakers on what's happening at the state level, uh, how to work with senators and um, all members of the legislature on these issues, and what's coming up in the next uh, six months that we can be doing to um, really communicate effectively and make sure that they're hearing the needs of the early childhood system. So Senator Dolan, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for having me and thank you for sharing uh, your perspective again at the at the state, local, and programmatic level. Uh, first, I just want to take a few seconds to thank you all uh, because of the service you are providing. Uh, you are providing a necessary service for children, a necessary service for parents, and a necessary service for our economy. Because if you aren't open, parents can't go to work, and we know how that where that leads. So thank you. And you also demonstrated this morning that you, uh, in extraordinary times, did extraordinary things, uh, all for the benefit of children, parents, and our economy. So we thank you. Uh, one of the first things we did when the pandemic hit uh, is hopefully is to show that we understood the importance of early childhood care. And that is we provided those payments that you talked about, uh, even though your centers were closed, because we knew that hiring staff, finding staff, uh, and getting your centers open on a moment's notice, whether it was initially a pandemic center or ultimately uh, reopening the centers at various rate ratios, that if, you, if we didn't continue to make sure that you could pay your staff and prepare your buildings, there would be another delay. And that delay has consequences, again, for parents, children, and our economy. So um, total now, it's about $131 million that we have been able to distribute out to uh, child care throughout the state. Um, I think this afternoon, you will hear another announcement where we're gonna be adding another $10 million uh, uh, for that various service. So we wanna recognize the importance. Um, I, I know like in any part of this pandemic, no matter what industry you're in, um, I know that whatever help we are trying to provide does not match the need. Uh, and uh, you're not alone in that. I don't know if that's going to make you feel better, but we understand that the needs are greater than the resources that we are providing. Uh, and we have to make very difficult decisions as to uh, where these dollars are going. Uh, but I, I, I'm very comfortable in saying that we're adding more money this afternoon. All right, so in my brief moments here, I wanna to talk to you about uh, budget and advocacy. That's what you've asked me to talk about. As in any uh, budget process, it is always very, very fluid, uh, very uncertain. That is um, even more so today. Uh, because there are two budgets that we have to start working on. That is, of course, we are in fiscal year 21, uh, and we have commitments that we have made through the end of June uh, uh, to various uh, agencies throughout the state, including uh, uh, daycares. So we have to match up the revenues, the uncertain revenues, to make sure we meet the needs of 21. The revenues now are not great, but they're not as bad as we thought. Uh, and if that can hold true throughout the process, throughout the remaining months of this fiscal year, uh, with some slight cuts and some uh, use of dollars elsewhere, which I'll get to in a second, we feel we can meet the commitments, nearly all the commitments that we've made. I said uncertainty. Um, we are, of course, experiencing another spike. Uh, the spike is happening also at the very time that is extremely important for a lot of businesses throughout the state, and that is the fourth quarter. A lot of businesses make most of their revenue in the fourth quarter. If the fourth quarter is low, then we not only will experience less revenues from 
the fourth quarter, but as we move into the first quarter, that is January, February, and March, it is possible that it's the very unfortunate circumstances that some of those businesses won't be with us. And if they're not with us, again, the revenue sources will go down. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but we have to prepare for that to happen. Uh, so um, we are watching it very carefully to make certain that we uh, meet the needs that we have committed. At the same time, we have the responsibility of building on the next budget, which begins July 1st. Uh, and that is a budget that we are going to have to base on projections. Where do we think the state's going to be? Where do we feel the revenues are going to be? Uh, right now, it's hard to make those projections. And the governor is in the, it has the first crack at it, and they're putting their budget together now with the understanding that they're projecting what it might be uh, do we have a vaccine? Do we have drugs that can mitigate it? Uh, are people taking individual responsibility, thus slowing the spread? If that's the case, then we, we can project that perhaps maybe our revenues will rise and we can budget accordingly. If the, re if the vaccine's not available, if the mitigation's not there, if people continue to uh, gather when they shouldn't be gathering, uh, we could have a slow economy and thus we have to make very, very difficult draconian decisions. Um, one thing I want to make, you know, I think a lot of people are probably going to ask, okay, what about the quote rainy day fund? Uh, well, the rainy day fund's actual description is the budget stabilization fund. And uh, let me put that in perspective. We, rounding, we have $3 billion in our budget stabilization fund. Our annual budget is $72 billion. So we have about 2.5% of our revenues in the rainy day fund. So it is not the panacea that sometimes it gets portrayed as. All we have to do is dip into that and all our revenue woes go away. We're going to have to be strategic in when and how we use those dollars to fill the needs uh, through July. I don't advocate for building a budget going forward on it, but the, I do advocate that strategic use of it. But again, it is not going to solve all revenue woes. Uh, it's, there's just not that kind of money. Uh, in it, as much as $3 billion sounds like a lot of money, which rolls me into advocacy. Um, I don't need to spend any time with this group, uh, with Pre for Clee, for Groundworks, led by Shannon Jones, who I hope is on the call. Uh, you guys are absolutely top-notch in terms of your advocacy uh, to, with the state legislature. You guys are, in fact, relentless in your pursuit of making sure that we are aware of the quality services and what you need from the state to continue those quality services. So it's not a matter of gearing up and making sure you have the ability to do it. You have the ability to do it. Now we have to make sure that the advocacy is as pointed as possible. And the big elephant in the room besides COVID is of course is step up to quality. And step up to quality was funded through this budget and a lot of the dollars were spent uh, were TANF dollars. And there's not a great degree of certainty that the level of TANF dollars required to meet the needs of Step Up to Quality will be there next biennium. I'm not, I don't know whether that's a fact yet or not, but I think the trend when we put the money in last time was that it won't be there, or at least not anywhere near what the need is. So difficult decisions are going to have to be made. So when you go to advocate, you have to think a couple things. When we do our next budget, we'll have a similar governor, but we will have a new speaker and a new Senate president. So you're going to have to continue your relentless advocacy about talking about the necessity and the, and the quality of step up to quality. But you may also have to be able to, to say, we have to, do we have to revisit it given, given the revenue situations? Um, do we, you know, if someone is half public or 20% public and 80% private, do they need to be step up to quality? Uh, maybe they lose a little bit of public funds if you choose not to do that. Um, we're going to have to figure out a way to educate members on the importance of having quality daycare centers, uh, but recognize that as much as you, know, you guys have agreed to delays and pushback deadlines, uh, the revenue sources may put us in that position again. So, um, you know, do we make difficult decisions and say, okay, 
keeping the program alive uh, and incentivizing daycares to finally get there is, is, is as important or more important uh, than cutting the program and saying we're no longer going to do it. These, I realize, are not decisions we're going to make today. Uh, they're not even decisions I'm asking you to, dis to discuss today. It is the reality, though, that that is going to be if TANF funds are not available. And we have to just put uh, the step up to quality payments inside the box of general revenue funds. Understand, you are competing with K through 12. You are competing with higher education. You are competing with Medicaid. You are competing with uh, um, uh, re uh, prisons and rehabilitation. You are competing with H2 Ohio, which is the governor's uh, and uh, program to help clean water throughout the state. So. Uh, you know, the advocacy that you provide is going to be required, but understand what box that you're playing. So, look, I know that sounds a little doom and gloom, um, um, but, you know, the hope is um, that we are relatively back to normal soon and we can get our revenues going to where they were pre-pandemic because pre-pandemic we were showing revenues above projection. We were showing low unemployment. We were actually showing a, a, a uh, a reduced uh, Medicaid um, roles. So we can get back there again uh, and make sure that we are providing for the necessary services that help grow a vibrant economy and quality daycare, quality early education is a part of that. So I look forward to the, your questions. Uh, if I can be successful in a couple of weeks, I look forward to working with you uh, uh, to build on what we've, what you've started and continue quality um, daycares in Ohio. So thank you and look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Senator, and thank you for all your support of the system and all you've done to work to support quality, especially um, we really appreciate your taking the time to deeply understand the system and and to support that work um, and so we want to move now to um, Senator Antonio who also is going to share her thoughts um, on working uh, with her colleagues in the Senate and working across the aisle um, and uh, what's coming up in from her perspective so thank you so much uh, Senator Antonio Thank you, um, and thanks to everybody on, um, on this call. And I really wanna thank uh, the folks at Step Up and uh, Pre for Clee. And, um, you know, it's, it's such a difficult time as, as we've heard um, from some of the situations uh, where we're at today. Um, I don't think any of us could have anticipated this, but I, um, I have faith that we will be able to get through this. <laughs> um, and I know that people are being creative um, and, and constantly um, readjusting uh, to be able to provide quality uh, childcare for our kids and families um, as, we, as we go through this, navigate this, this pandemic. I appreciate the comments of my colleague, Senator Dolan, because he really mapped out for you um, what, that, what that budget, pro all the considerations that we'll be making uh, through the budget process. And so I don't have to go back over that because he did such a great job of um, really articulating what we're going to be up against and it's a moving target uh too the unknowns are ever present every time there's a spike for the state uh with regard to covid um what we thought last week might be a really good idea and a way forward now we have to readjust and so i know that's true on the front lines where you all are um, but it's definitely also considerations that those of us uh, policymakers have to be considering as well it's been mentioned uh, earlier, I think, um, at the beginning of this conversation, but I think it's worth re-addressing uh, the fact that COVID has shined a spotlight on those issues that were um, concerns, issues, inequalities that we needed 
um, that we had been addressing or needed addressing, and COVID is just has just spotlighted them for us. Um, my caucus has been working to, um, we have a resolution that would declare that um, racism is a health crisis in the state of Ohio. And under that umbrella um, are all of the ways that COVID for sure has exacerbated the lives of um, folks in our, in our state, especially people of color, um, especially low-income families and those families who, are, um, who don't enjoy equality and equity, um, but are working towards receiving it and achieving it. Um, but that means that there is a bigger struggle. Um, it, we, we did some research, um, cost for COVID treatment can vary widely. Even, even getting test results back, depending on where you live, um, can, can make a difference of um, anywhere from 24 to 48 hours in the state of Ohio. That's something we need to change because as these kinds of things affect families, then um, our children and their ability to be able to not get behind um, if they're not in their classrooms, if they're not with the program that they had been enjoying before COVID hit, um, we're very concerned about will they lose ground developmentally. And so we know that we have to continue to be able to, um, to address that as hopefully things will be able to open up uh, in the near future. We also know that COVID is affecting um, their, the housing crisis and people who are experiencing uh, receiving eviction notices. And we also know that that disproportionately affects black women um, when it comes to evictions in general. So again, during COVID, uh, black female renters are twice as likely to be evicted than white renters. So we know that this will continue um, to exacerbate during this crisis. Um, we did talk um, and address, it has been mentioned a couple of times, the continued priorities um, with regards to trying to get some more funding into, into early childhood, um, into these programs. There was a slight bump in the GRF line uh, last time, last budget, the current budget we're in right now, the maintenance of effort for publicly funded childcare. So, so we, did, we did see a bump, but we also saw, and I think uh, Senator Dolan made mention of this, um, just that we have to be concerned about those federal dollars that come uh, down to us in the state because um, there was a reduction from 2000, um, there's a $63 million decrease in fiscal year 21 um, from fiscal year 20. And so for, on the federal level, those federal dollars. So again, they're affected. We're affected in the state of Ohio as a result of that. Um, we have to keep looking at um, where those CARES Act dollars go. And then again, at the same time, we have legislation. Um, we believe we're gonna have a very busy lame duck. I hope so, because there are a lot of bills that are queued up, good pieces of legislation um, that we just haven't been able to get moved. Some of it is actually COVID related as well. And so um, I think as we go forward, um, one of the things that I found interesting in just listening to the presentations before us um, was some of the things that, again, uh, businesses, communities are dealing, the school, our, our schools are dealing with, um, which is this, the need for testing and the need for testing materials to be paid for. And I think that's something that the legislature has to look at, whether it's through CARES Act dollars. We hope there will be an additional stimulus package that comes. Um, but being able, if we're going to contain this, this uh, virus, we have to be able to test and contact trace and contain and quarantine um, is the only way that ultimately we will be able to get on the other side of this. And so um, I also appreciated, and I'd like to hear more about those ideas around centralized purchasing and um, 
because I think that that, and if there's any way that budget wise, we can address that, I think would be great. But the legislature, I have been a strong proponent over the many years that we need to continue to invest in our early childhood programs, quality programs, and, and our children and our families. And um, as Senator Dolan said, as far as um, reaching out to us and advocating, you do all do a wonderful job. Um, you are a model because what you do is incrementally discuss with us. You, you never stop um, informing us, keeping us up to date on how things have changed, um, what the reality is on the front line for you and for the families that you serve. That makes a world of difference, but what we have to remember after this election, not only will leadership be different, we will have new members, um, both in the House and the Senate, uh, because of term limits, because of just uh, the fact that we've just had, a, we will just have had an election. There are gonna be some folks that you're gonna be starting with um, in January from square one. Uh, they will uh, be new to everything. Um, not new hopefully to their communities and understanding those issues some of them will bring a varied expertise and background with them but it will be important to definitely bring them up to speed on um, on on the issues that are so important understanding them to be able to be um the best advocates all the way through i have faith that uh you will as always do that just just fine, uh, because that is um, certainly certainly what uh, you have shown um, in your ability to reach out, to educate, to advocate. Um, it's a it's a tough time, and I think I think the thing I want to leave with, so we can have time to get to some questions, leave you with is that um, I think the most important thing throughout this is is being able to have just like we need continuous improvement as we as we do things we need continuous communication and updating um, how the pandemic how this virus is really affecting day to day um, when things are able to shift and when not um, but ultimately i think um, the work that you do um, is incredibly important because because you you hold our future in your hands those little beings that so need to be um, working on all those quality uh, programs and activities to be able to really enhance and improve their, their development. And um, I have faith that we will be able to get to the other side of this, but your input and your, um, your explanation of exactly where things might be able to even um, take a shift or be flexible is going to be incredibly important as we go forward into the budget cycle. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you uh, for asking me to be here today, and I'm interested in your questions. All right, thank you so much, Senator Antonio, as always, for your support and your insights and I think really bringing in those other issues of equity and all of the things that families are facing and also highlighting the need for testing and proactive um, support for um, child care centers and many systems across the state. So that's certainly a big part of what we're here to talk about and I appreciate your uh, support for that. So um, we've had such a rich discussion, we're almost out of time. So what I want to do, um, we, we do have questions from the panel or from the audience. And I just want to remind everybody, we will be recording all of those and giving all of the, your questions and comments to the senators. So they will, even if we don't have a chance to ask it today, they will see those. Um, and so thank you for participating. And as in the last couple of minutes, if you have more questions or comments, please enter them into the chat box. They will be received by the senators. So I just actually wanted to both of you um, ask one final question. You know, we've talked a lot about um, a, a lot of different needs, certainly the needs of families, the needs of programs. Um, financial need is a huge part of that in order to not lose a major part of our childcare system, something that would take us really decades to recover from. Um, and also thinking about how do we advance our quality goals 
um, still during this period. And that's something that we need to think about too. But I actually wanted to end with a question. I know Senator Dolan talked about what is going to happen with our businesses, which is a really important part of our system. What we have, I think one thing we've struggled with is how do we connect the importance of a strong and healthy childcare system with the need to support our businesses and also childcare system as businesses themselves. Um, and, you know, we talk a lot about early learning, of course, that is our focus, child development, early learning, kindergarten readiness. But we also know it's a critical part of the workforce, the support for our workforce. And also, especially now as we recover from this pandemic, getting families back to work. So in the couple of minutes that we have left, if you could both you know, give us your perspective on how do we better connect? Um, I think we've got, done a good job of connecting it with early learning, but how do we now connect it with the importance of, of childcare as a support for the workforce and a support for our pandemic recovery? Uh, so, all right, I'll go. Um, so just by the very question, you are making that link. Um, you know, you know I, I think we all talk about uh, creating a vibrant economy. We talk, you know, whether the path we get there may be different, but it's, it's, it's you know, fair taxes, low taxes, fair regulation, quality energy, uh, infrastructure, workforce development, healthcare, and childcare that you can't have a vibrant economy if all of those pillars don't exist. So you guys are very, very much a part of that discussion. And I, just the fact that you're asking that question should tell legislators that you get the importance of a growing economy and your role in it. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So, yeah. So um, what's interesting is, you know, a lot of times we talk about this too. We can't, these are systems that are all interconnected and functioning in, in our communities. They're not silos. We have to, we have to stop thinking about chi child care is in one silo, business is in another. I, I like, Katie, that, you know, you identified, um, you know, child care supports businesses, but it also is a business. Yeah. And I think that's really, really important to, um, to keep in mind for us to function on, as well as the fact that the dollars that we invest in our children at a young age, very early, first step, um, we gain so much in return later on in their lives. And we can never lose sight of that. It's, it's hard, I think, for us sometimes to um, have that long range uh, look, but we have to be able to do that and to acknowledge that. The other area that I think we absolutely cannot ignore anymore and really need to focus on going forward in this next year is increasing the pay of frontline providers. Um, they have our most precious cargo, our most press, precious children, these children that are our future, and yet we do not pay them at a level that is equal to the importance of their jobs and what they provide for us and our families. And I think we really have to make uh, a real change for that. And just like the investment in those children gives us a return, the investment in those workers will give us a return in our communities as well. So I think it's money well invested. We have to figure out how to do better and pay um, the staff at a, at a higher rate. Thanks. Well, Senator, you have a warm audience for that, for that <laughs> comment, for sure. Um, and that's, that's wonderful to hear. And we, we couldn't agree more, um, you know, from, every resource research perspective, you know, staff and the relationship of staff with children are what make the difference in quality. And so making sure that we're asking staff um, who are coming back to, to serve on the front lines, really put their own health at risk to make sure that our economy can get going and that we can continue to serve children. Um, we really need to think about how we support them and that's wonderful to hear. So that's all the time we have. Um, sorry we didn't get to a lot of discussion, but I think the, the panel was um, really added a lot of really wonderful perspective and we're so grateful to 
um, our panelists, Michelle Curry, Carla Martin, and Ann Gutierrez, and then of course, uh, our senators who took time out of their very busy schedules to be with us today, to hear this conversation, to be a part of it, um, and for all of the support that they give to the system. We really appreciate your partnership with us in um, trying to strengthen our early childhood system and our workforce so that we can all be stronger together. Um, just finally, just for, we will um, share all of your comments. Um, this conversation is far from over. This is one conversation and in a series of conversations we hope to have with policymakers um, as we recover from the pandemic and look ahead to the budget process. Thank you so much for being here um, and we will be in touch soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.